Okay, and we're live. Jared, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Hi. Perfect. Hi. All the way from the States. Yes. <laughs> uh, so just a quick reminder, uh, Pride in the Living Room was founded by the Israeli LGBT task force Ha'agudah in memory of the 2009 Tel Aviv Gay Center shooting and the Jerusalem Pride Parade stabbing in 2015. And uh, Ha'agudah founded this project to, um, to inspire empathy and community by telling the stories of LGBT Jews from around the world. And uh, all of that said, it is my pleasure to welcome Jared to the stage. It's weird, we're both called Jared. It'll be a bit confusing today, but uh, we'll work we're it out. We're both called Jared and I'm, I'm, I'm on a weekend trip with some friends and there's another Jared here. So uh, there's lots of Jareds. We call each other the Jari. The Jari? Jari. <laughs> That's the plural. We, we can do that too. <laughs> okay, I'd like to welcome another member of the Jari uh, fraternity to tell his story. <laughs> Over to you. Well, thank you. So I've, I've, I've had the opportunity to look at some of the other stories um, from some of the other people that you've interviewed, some of these other amazing gay Jews, and um, lots of really amazing content here and lots of amazing things to hear and I, lots of happiness and lots of struggle at the same time. And certainly I can't compete with everybody, um, but I hope that I contribute something unique and meaningful, um, very meaningful to me. So, you know, my journey really starts in high school. I can't quite remember the first time that I realized that I was gay, but starting at the, you know, my, my journey through high school in some ways mirrors the journey of coming out. And um, it's a very, very, uh, you know, my the, my the beginning of high school is very different from the end of high school. So I'd like to kind of go through that and then add on to it a little bit more. But beginning of high school, I was in my synagogue's choir. I was in junior ROTC. I was, didn't, I was not accepting of the fact that I was gay. I think I knew but it was like, ah, oh, no, not, not really. No, it's not gonna, that's not gonna come to fruition. I grew up in a small town about an hour north of New York City. Um, I, not the kind of place where people just generally go and become gay. Um, small Jewish community in my, you know, lots of towns with large Jewish communities in, in Westchester and Putnam County. Mine, smaller Jewish community, as I often joke, a one synagogue town. Um, but it, it is not expected that people, not really many gay people at all, and not didn't have anyone to really look up to in that sense. So really did not acknowledge it, didn't even think about it. Um, so like I said, synagogue choir, um, track team, um, junior ROTC, which is a, a military training organization for high school students. So I really wanted to go to the Naval Academy and I wanted to be a Naval officer. That was my, that was my dream at the time um really kept it repressed for a while and really focused on that those couple of things in my life track um rotc the military component and my synagogue um all three of which meant a great deal to me and um starting around junior year i started sort of rebelling from it a little bit i started smoking a little weed um started drifting from all of that don't know if it was because my gay side was coming out or, or just deciding to you know to show itself a little bit more or i started feeling youthful typical youthful rebellion i had been such a good boy up until that point and decided i needed to start rebelling a little bit a little later in high school i think i wish I had gotten the, rebe the rebellious part out a little sooner than wait until junior year, but suddenly started um, dyeing my hair, <laughs> going, to, going to punk rock shows, um, smoking a little weed here and there, um, really um, not acting the same. I think someone at my choir, at my shul, noticed that something was a little different when I started wearing little black wristbands to, uh, to, to, to services. And she was like, oh, there's something different about you. And then I dyed my hair. And that, you know, in the Jewish world, you just don't really dye your hair that often. Um, not men anyway. So when I dyed my hair, that was, uh, it was, it was almost like a, a little, everyone was like a little taken aback by it. Um, and then at one point, at one point junior year, I had a girlfriend. Um, and the minute I turned 18, her stepfather was like, nope, this boy's an adult now. You can't, you know, you guys cannot be together anymore. So that, that's, that's the end of that. So that was 
it was upsetting to me, but it was not upsetting because I lost the girlfriend because I didn't truly, she's a, she's a great person and she still is, but um, it was because I, I did not really love or have feelings for her. I had the girlfriend because that was something that I think you knew you're supposed to do. And up to that point, I was all about doing the things that you were supposed to do. So no longer had the girlfriend, but at the same time that I had the girlfriend was beginning to enter what I call the punk rock phase of my life, um, was hanging out with some guys on the side, refused to acknowledge that this hanging out with guys on the side and doing the kind of things that teenagers do when they hang out with guys on the side meant that I was gay. Didn't even, didn't, I, I was still had every intention on meeting a woman, marrying, having a family, um, didn't have any vision of whether or not that was going to be a, a, a religious life or not. But, you know, it was, it was about getting out, marrying, having a family um, with a woman. But I was doing these things with guys on the side. And I think I was convinced, oh, maybe I'll just keep on doing, you know, hanging out with guys on the side. And that would be, and that would go on like that. Um, at some point junior year, a bunch of my friends dragged me into a room and uh, almost kind of locked me in there. And they said, Jared, are you gay? And I was like, no. Are you gay, Jared? Are you gay? We know you're gay. Just tell us that you're gay. It's all going to be fine. Just tell us that you're gay. And I was like, no, 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 I'm not. And one of them said, if you're lying to me, I'm going to out you. If I ever find out that you're lying to me, I'm going to out you. Um, and he kept his promise because somehow, I don't know how, I don't know where, or this person has, this friend has actually since passed away, so I can't ask him. Um, he found out something. I have no idea what or where, but he found out something and he told the entire school. Um, might as well have put it over the loudspeaker. Jared Arader is a big old faggot because he told the entire school. Um, I apologize to your viewers for talking that way, but this is just how, how it felt. And it, you know, it, 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 I started having to confront it every day at school, people coming up to me, Jared, are you really, are you really gay? You're really gay. And I was not prepared for it because I still was not thinking of myself as gay. It, to me, in my mind, gay was this funny little thing that I did with guys that I met on the internet on the side. Um, wasn't really a part of that, of that experience, um, of the experience of what I, of what I wanted. And especially in the punk rock world, forget the military, forget about how this was back during the days of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. So immediately my dream of going to the Naval Academy was, was done. Um, I had a friend who was a lesbian a year ahead of me who went to West Point and was out at West Point. And what they put her through before kicking her out was hell. And I certainly wasn't going to go through that. So those dreams were done. And I was confronting this all these people coming, you know, coming at me in school, are you really gay, are you really gay? Not being able to accept that myself, having to have everybody essentially tell me that I'm gay. Um, and uh, uh, I just remembered how that friend found out. Um, if you don't mind my going a little back and forth, that friend found out that I was gay because I told his girlfriend in the Red Rooster parking lot, the Red Rooster is a little ice cream shop in my hometown, and uh, to told her in, in my car, told her, I said, Amy, I think that I might be a little bisexual, maybe. maybe. Maybe I think that's what I told her. I certainly was not willing to or ready yet to acknowledge that I was gay. So that's how it got back to him. But anyway, um, so eventually at some point, end of senior year, told my parents, which went over fine. My parents were totally cool, totally accepting. But then I went to college and I decided at the beginning of college that from then on, I was going to be gay, gay, 100%, totally gay, in your face, gay, gay, all the time. And any of my friends who might remember me from freshman year can remember that I was that gay guy. I was the only gay guy in my, in my dorm. And uh, I got a lot of attention for it. For the first time in my life, I was like, felt like one of the cool kids um, because of all the attention that I got. Um, but I think deep down, there was still a lot of hardship. I couldn't find anyone to, to love. I went to this small, my freshman year, I went to the small liberal arts college in Western Connecticut and called Western Connecticut State University. Um, doesn't get any more boring than that. And, uh, you know, I, I wasn't finding anyone to go on dates with or anything. It wasn't a very gay school. So I transferred to a place called Purchase College, 
which I had heard, I was, I literally one day looked up like gay schools, New York. And of course, you know, NYU shows up, um, schools with big gay populations shows up, but then Purchase College shows up. And I knew Purchase College because it was about an hour from my parents, from my parents' house. And I was like, oh, well, this will be easy. Um, it's a SUNY, it was a state school, so it would be cheap. Um, so let's, let's just transfer there. Didn't even bother, didn't even really think about it too much. Just decided to transfer to Purchase College and suddenly went to Purchase and immediately had a little bit of buyer's remorse because Purchase was so gay that you weren't really one of the cool kids. You, were, you didn't really stand out for being gay at Purchase because it was a, for a small liberal arts school, very gay. And, you know, when, so surrounded by lots of guys, still couldn't really find anyone to, to be in a relationship with, anyone to, to go on dates with. They'd go on dates with a few guys. Again, I apologize to your readers, but this is just a part of the story. Lots of hookups, um, but not, not really, you know, totally the, the romance that I was looking for. Um, and by the way, at this point, at this point in time, at this point in college, I had totally abandoned Judaism. Um, I, I would occasionally, I would see every year during the Hagim, I would see the sukkah on campus, but I had no intention on going in it. And the rabbi of the Hillel was gay. And I was like, I can't do that. I can't, I can't, I'm, I'm not even, I, I wasn't even ready to, I wasn't even at a point in my life of reassociating with anything Jewish that I even wanted to have anything to do with the gay rabbi at Hillel. Now as a 35 year old man, I'm like, gay rabbi, I want to talk to this guy, but had no, no desire to talk to this gay rabbi at, at Purchase College. So, so be it. Went through Purchase, um, stopped being punk rock, um, despite now at that point having three punk rock tattoos. Stopped being punk rock, started being more this goody boys, you know, the goody two shoes again. Worked at Abercrombie and Fitch. How'd that happen? Um, yes, I was one of those people. Um, but then, uh, you know, so then I went to law school. And then, and then this is where I started to realize that I seem to just like always try to fit in. And I went to law school, again, decided to start law school totally out. But the school I picked for law school was totally a totally different environment. Take Purchase College, small, very queer, very artsy, liberal arts college with a major arts program. I was a journalism major, um, did a lot of reporting for a while like you do. Um, major arts scene, went to this school called Roger Williams University up in Rhode Island, which is the preppiest, literally on the water, preppiest boat shoes, um, place that you can imagine, um, like vests, boat shoes, um, pumpkin spice lattes, just everything you can imagine about New England rolled into a little ball. This was Roger Williams University. And I started being like, oh, well, I need to also like buy Ralph Lauren polo shirts, but somehow make them look gay. And, but again, I found myself once again, being one of the only gay people because my law school had like very, very few of us, small law school and even smaller gay population. But the difference this time was that I was just not one of the cool kids because I did not go to football games and uh, do the sort of preppy things that they did. So somehow, and I don't quite remember how, and maybe I will during the course of this conversation, but I reacquainted myself with Judaism, started going to a synagogue in Providence again, and over the course of time while I was in law school, became very, very reacquainted with, became very active in that synagogue, um, became active in helping organize and marshal their younger professionals community. Um, they liked having, you know, this was a, this was a progressive conservative synagogue, um, you know, conservative as in the conservative movement, but, and I grew up going to a reform synagogue. So this was a little bit of a change of pace, but progressive, very progressive, conservative synagogue, they loved having <laughs> a gay guy there. Um, so it, it, I really felt loved at that synagogue, um, loved and welcome and quickly, you know, established myself there. Um, really, really, really did enjoy it. Um, so stayed there, stayed in Providence a year or so after I graduated law school, 
um, then moved back to New York. And for whatever reason, when I moved back to New York, I think I realized, I came to realize in New York, I moved into the city, right? And New York just has such a bigger Jewish community than I'd ever lived in before. I discovered that I wasn't so religious. I was really not all about the religious component. I learned all about it, being in a choir, being in a synagogue choir as a kid and being active in that conservative synagogue. I learned all about it. Um, but really discovered that I wasn't very spiritual, wasn't very religious, but loved the community aspect of it. And when you're in New York City, um, the gay Jewish community in New York City is like nothing else, maybe maybe like nothing else outside of, you know, the, the only comparable thing is probably Tel Aviv. Um, I'd love to hear all about Melbourne sometime. But um, it, I found that I, I really found myself in that community. Um, lots of great people, some of whom you've interviewed and who I'm, whom I'm friends with, I've seen. So it, you know, I stuck with that for a couple of years. I was in a Fire Island Pines share, which is uh, the Fire Island Pines, for those of your viewers who don't know, is a wonderful little, uh, little gay community about an hour outside of New York City where lots of gay guys, mostly cisgender, uh, mostly cisgender guys go um, during the summer. I was in a Jewish house, a kosher keeping house for two years. Um, that was pretty cool. Um, over time, I, I started not, I started sort of distancing myself, not on purpose, not sure why. I started kind of pulling back from the gay Jewish world in New York City as well. Um, again, just sort of how things naturally change over time. And um, started hanging out more in Brooklyn where I live and met my amazing boyfriend who's now my boyfriend of four years. He's not Jewish. Um, he works for a Jewish nonprofit, but he's not himself Jewish. And um, going back to my time in Providence, I was desperately trying to find a Jewish man. And I often got very frustrated and upset that I wasn't finding and wasn't meeting a Jewish partner. That's part of the reason why I moved back to New York City. Um, one short time, one short term boyfriend that I had while I was in Providence, um, another, you know, a, a guy who was equally, if not way more religious than I am. As a matter of fact, he's a conservative rabbi now. So that, that lasted a couple months. It didn't work out. I moved back to New York, hoping that I would find a Jewish guy, um, didn't. And it was almost like, it almost got to the point of like, you're, I was in Providence, like it was desperation. Anytime I met a gay Jewish guy, it was instantly like, let's go on a date, right? Moved back to New York City. I was like, God, there's so many of you. <laughs> Who am I going to choose? Who do I want to go on a date with? I can't, I can't figure this out. There, there's too many. Um, of course, you know, in New York City, it, it's a beautiful, amazing, almost, almost too good. You know, it, to be a gay Jewish guy in New York City is a, uh, it's a buffet. Um, and uh, for whatever reason, I met this amazing guy who's not Jewish and I've been with him for four and a half years and we're, you know, we're, we're tremendously happy. He's not with me on this trip right now because I'm, uh, I'm involved in what's called the political club. It's a volunteer uh, political organization. I'm the president of it. My team and I are actually out here on a, on a weekend retreat just to bond and, and discuss planning for the election and upcoming year and the you know elections that are going to the local mayoral like election that's going to be happening next year so that's what we're here doing this weekend so my my partner david is not and his name is david and he's not jewish um he's not here this weekend but he's at home with our cat um back in brooklyn but i'd certainly to summarize say that my my experience um as as an openly gay jew has been uh has had ups and downs. I'm very, very privileged because I, you know, in, in the sense of knowing, you know, not just a couple of people that you've interviewed, but knowing so many guys from deeply conservative and religious backgrounds um, and, and, and learning and experiencing over time what they've gone through um, has made me, you know, is, is very humbling because they've been through some pretty harrowing things that I, that I myself haven't gone through. Um, I certainly would say so, you know some of the experience of being outed in a in a small um, upstate Hudson Valley town is was scary, but what some of these guys went through, um, I don't think I could compare to. So I, I I owe a great deal to them for being able to to really make and shape what being a gay Jew is, um, and and 
shine a light on some of the hardships that they've had. Um, I only hope that what I have to add here can do justice to the gay Jewish experience. So I thank you for, for doing this. And I thank you for doing this, this project. This is pretty cool. I, I just want to start by saying thank you, Jared, other Jared, maybe I'm the other Jared, <laughs> for, uh, for your candor and um, for being open to sharing this really intimate story. Um, I, we have an audience ranging from you know, Orthodox Jews all the way to non-Jewish LGBT people. Everybody watches stories. Everybody takes something special away. And um, so thank you for sharing what you shared today. I have a couple of questions, if that's okay. I'll try. <laughs> but I wrote so many things down. Um, okay, I have to ask, what colors did you dye your hair? Black. Black and blonde. Like separately or like stripes? Or? <laughs> Not at the same time. It was at one point in high school when I was all more punk rock, it was black. I was like, this whole strawberry blonde thing is not working for me. Maybe I had a repressed feeling like striving red strawberry blonde hair was very gay and I wanted to get rid of it. So I dyed it black. But then in college, when I was full on out there, gay, 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 it was um, blonde highlights. Right. I'm interested to know, um, I've spoken with various people about uh, the desire to sort of um, overtly portray gayness into the world when, when they are sort of forming their identity or sort of um, going through that, that process. I'm just interested to know, where did you, um, so you obviously made choices on how to be like overtly gay. I'm wondering where you got those influences from. There were so little, um, there were so few examples for me um, coming out um, from the beginning that I, I was really felt like, like I think many others felt like they were really charting their own course. Um, I didn't, you know, I didn't have, some examples might have come from, there was no social media. Um, so some of the examples might have really come from pop culture. Um, you know, maybe, you know, maybe, maybe I wanted to be a lawyer because I watched too much Will and Grace and thought, um, well, um, I can, I can be like Will and uh, be a gay lawyer. And, you know, may, maybe that was one, one idea. But certainly when I started college in 2004, um, people were starting to come out slowly at that time. Um, but, you know, if you weren't, if you were outside of New York City, there were certainly not many people to model it after. Mm. Uh, okay, let's rewind. I, I was actually in a shul choir myself, mm. a synagogue choir. Uh, do you have any songs you can share with us? <laughs> you want me to sing? Um, uh, yes, you don't have to. Just have we, to throw it out there. We had a pretty, um, we had a pretty cool version of Hine Matov that went Hine Matov Umanaim Shevadachim Gam Yachad Hine Matov Umanaim Shevadachim Gam Yachad How good it is for all of us to join together in song Da 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 I lost it somewhere, but yeah, that's how most of it went. And then, of course, you know the standard. Look, this is a reform show, so it it was not the songs were not as traditional. There was one song even that we sang that I later embarrassingly found out was actually from a Christian melody. The the tune came from a uh, came from a, a Christian melody. Um, I can't remember exactly which song, but I was uh, at a when I during my more religious phase in law school, I was at a Shabbat dinner and started singing it. And some of the people looked at me and they're like, what are you doing? You realize that that's like this goyish song, right? I was like, oh God, what did, <laughs> what did I just do? <laughs> um. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I, I, I have my own version of Hine Matov. It go, goes, uh, 
הנה מה טוב ומנעים שבשחים גם יחד הנה מה טוב ומנעים שבטחים גם יחד Let's see if the harmony works over Zoom, but... Yeah, beautiful, beautiful songs. So there's something really interesting you said when you were, when you had a girlfriend and you were sort of exploring your sexuality on the side and you didn't self-identify as gay or even bisexual at that time. Maybe bisexual a little bit later, but... I've had many, many, many conversations with people, even throughout this project, about this idea of sort of living a double life, or sort of having, you know, pursuing a girlfriend, pursuing a marriage, pursuing that sort of straight uh, identity, and then on the side, maybe behind closed doors, exploring, um, exploring that side of yourself. Um, so, can you talk a little bit about? Um, I guess, what led you to that strategy and maybe the, the effect it had on you? I didn't have many options. And, you know, at the time it was going online into what we would look at now as being very seedy chat rooms. Um, but I, I knew that I, I just deep down somehow knew that the only, um, the only satisfaction that I could gain would be from from another man um, that I needed that I needed to pursue this, and if I didn't, it's not even if I didn't. There was just I didn't give myself an option. It was just like you're gonna, you know, this is what you're gonna do. You're 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 you know you're you're talking to these guys online, and one day, and, you know, the Hudson Valley is a big place, and back then there was no grinder, there was no. Uh, you know, back then you'd go on gay.com and the chat room was New York. Well, I might live in the Hudson Valley, but most of the guys in the chat room were down in the city, um, which when you're 16, you know, getting into the city is a, a 16 and from a place an hour north of the city is, you know, it's an ordeal. You got to get on the train and everything and go into the city, which you know, now I do that to go visit my parents all the time, but I think about it and I was like, back then that was kind of scary to do. And I would find guys closer to me. Suddenly, I, you know, suddenly someone came up who was in one town away. Well, I can drive over there um, and just hang out with him. And what kind of drove me to it was, I certainly didn't know, that I, I didn't understand this aspect of myself maybe it would be good to just explore it. I think, um, I think sex finds a way to, to, to show itself somehow. Um, people will go far and wide for it. And ultimately you're going to drive yourself somehow to, 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 to figure it out. When did you make the transition from having these sexual experiences to self-describing as bisexual or, or even gay at the time? I convinced my, I finally, like when I was out in senior year, I, my response to everybody was like, would be like, would, you know, at the beginning of the year I was like, no, that's a lie. That's a lie. That's a lie. Gradually throughout the year, I would start saying, yeah, I'm bisexual. I'm bisexual. Okay. I'm bisexual. But then I think that I always knew that that was a lie. I think I up until up until senior year, I had convinced myself, right, that I was not that that I was living my truth as a straight guy with these side flings, right? Um, I started discovering my truth a little progressively throughout senior year, um, and then somehow something I skipped my prom, right? And I the reason I skipped my prom was because I really, really liked this guy and I thought we were going to hang out that night. I skipped my prom over thinking I was going to hang out with a guy, right? That's when I think I truly knew, wow, that is gay. You skipped your prom because you thought you were going to get to hang out with this guy that you thought you liked. I can't even remember his name today. Um, so clearly it was nothing, but I skipped my prom for it. Um, kind of a big deal, kind of like, kind of like that, 
put the nail in the coffin right there. Like you are, you are obviously gay. Not to erase the experiences of, of a bisexual person who might be a very legitimate bisexual. I don't want to imply that bisexuality is a means to cover up being gay because it's not. I have friends who are bisexual and I don't want any of them who watch this or any bisexual people who watch this to feel marginalized or erased in any way. This was my experience for myself, lying, essentially lying about being bisexual to get away with being gay. To get away with being gay. It's an interesting choice. To, yeah, to, 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 to keep the lie going, so to speak. To keep the lie to myself going in some ways. And how did the lie impact you at the time? I was really scared and I was just being gay. I just didn't want to get to that step. I did not want to admit to myself for the longest time that I was gay. So I, I, when you, when you've convinced yourself, you can convince yourself that a lie is the truth, right? And um, this is something that as a lawyer, I have to deal with all the time. You can convince yourself that a lie is the truth and continue to push it and push it and push it and find so many ways to convince yourself that the lie is actually fact. And one of the ways, and ultimately for me, I could not be gay. I was not ready to be gay. Being gay was just a step beyond the pale that I was not ready to get to. So I would just, you know, if it was being straight, I, I at one point convinced myself that you're allowed to be straight and have flings of guys on the side, you're still straight because you're not in a gay relationship. Then for a while, for a short period throughout my senior year, I was able to tell myself that I was bisexual because that was not gay. Um, where did I become okay with being gay? Probably that moment that I skipped my prom for a guy. Um, probably that moment that I, that I maybe that summer after I graduated and I, I, I let myself be more free and, and, and embraced it somehow. Maybe going to college and being with an entirely different group of people, I said, I don't have to lie anymore. These are people that I haven't known since kindergarten. These are people who I don't give a shit what they tell their parents about me. Because, um, you know, back in Brewster, my hometown, if so-and-so um, went and told his mom, um, his mom would call me or sorry, his mom would call my mother because that's not a hypothetical, that actually happened. And that mother then came to my mother and this hurt my mom in some ways that my mother found out that I was gay or bisexual, whatever it might be, through someone else's mother and not for me. And, you know, it's water under the bridge at that point. It does occasionally come up and, and it was very... Uh, you know, it was very upsetting to my mother that that's how, I think a lot of moms find out that way. I've heard the story repeated um, by other people. So it's not unique to me, but I certainly, certainly that was, that was tough. Um, and yeah, the, the, I didn't want that anymore. So when I, I, I started college, I said to myself, college is a time, you can just embrace this now. You don't have to hide anymore. You don't have to hide it anymore. From now on, you're going to, from now on, not only are you going to embrace it, but you're going to literally say, I'm Jared and I'm gay with every handshake of every new person you meet because you're just going to get it out in the open and out there and let them know. And if they want to be your friend, they'll be your friend. If they want you to, if they want to be a giant homophobe, better to find out then than later. Hmm. And it's that kind of mindset that led to you um, deciding that you were going to be gay in all the spaces you walked into. <laughs> and almost 20 years later, that's still the case. You know, I, I run an LGBTQ volunteer group. Um, I'm involved in a ton of LGBTQ um, organizations and events. Um, I'm on the Bar Association's LGBT committee. I mean, my whole volunteer experience now is gay, gay, gay all the time. So it hasn't really stopped. 
<laughs> I, I will just say at this point, um, so many of the stories I hear, there is a, a core element around the, you know, when the parents find out, when, when I tell them, when I'm outed to them, when they suspect, maybe they've always suspected, whatever it might be. Um, and it's a, a, a big focus of mine personally is in, um, is in the repairing of that relationship between parents and children. I think there's often when gay kids come out to their parents, there's often some misunderstanding or fear or anger or defensiveness. Um, and it sounds like at the time there was a bit of that um, happening. So I, I just want to say, I, I hope that, um, that you've made steps toward repairing that relationship since then. My parents and I are great. Uh, my parents, we have a, you know, it, it's it's great to be, um, so many of my friends in New York have moved halfway across the country to be in New York and don't get the experience of only being able to drive an hour away to visit their parents. And I'm incredibly lucky that I still can get that experience. Um, David, my boyfriend too, his parents are out on Long Island. So we, you know, we have the car, we can go and visit them regularly. So it's um, certainly there were some hard times um, when I first came out. There was certainly a distance and a disconnect, but my parents Im were immediately, immediately embraced it, immediately embraced me. We didn't even really ever have any hard conversations. There was no difficult, are you sure? Are you sure? There was none of that. It was always like, once I came out to them, my mother did express mild disappointment at first. She essentially wanted what I wanted. She wanted for me to have a normal straight life that I was going to have a, a, a wife, give her the grandchildren that she still wants and that she's still looking for um, <laughs> and still doesn't have, unfortunately. But, um, you know, there was that disappointment at, at first, but we got past it very quickly. I can see the exercise bike or exercise machine in the background, and you've spoken about being in track and um, training for the military. Can you give us a little, show us the arm muscles? Well, I will say this: I'm I'm at um, I'm at a rented place in the Poconos. It's a it's a it's a, it's a friend who I rent this place from every year. So it's not my exercise bike, but mm -hmm. but you, you're talking about these. Um, I haven't worked out in the entire coronavirus, so there's not much to show for it lately. I've certainly lost some muscle mass, unfortunately. I was doing CrossFit regularly for three and a half years, and then I, I gave it up because I hurt my wrist a little bit. Um, but I was certainly bigger then and, and less so now. <laughs> I, I feel like we've all got a legitimate excuse throughout Corona. Uh, <laughs> well, that leads me on to... Uh, don't ask, don't tell. Mm -hmm. So for the purposes of people who don't really know what that means, can you give a quick definition of what that's all about? Well, for years, the American military barred um, any kind of, if you were homosexual, you could not serve in the United States military. Um, that was true up until around, um, I think it was 1994 or 95, when President Clinton, uh, as part of a deal, um, to, as part of a deal said, basically enacted a, put a law in place that said, well, you can serve openly, uh, no, sorry, you can, you can serve if you're gay, but you cannot be open about it. Like you can be gay and be in the military, but you cannot live an openly gay lifestyle, which you cannot tell anybody that you're gay, which basically means that you have to lie about it because the, there, there is a legal truth in the sense that you, if you don't say anything, then you haven't said anything one way or the other about whether or not you're gay or straight. But the reality is, and we all know how the reality works, the reality is you're generally assumed to be straight until you actually acknowledge that you're gay. So that, that was the status quo from around 94 until, um, I can't remember which year Barack Obama, President Obama repealed it, but until President Obama repealed it for close to 20 or so years, that was the case that you, you could be gay and be in the military, you just could not serve openly. At the time, 
the don't ask, don't tell rule plus your own experiences being outed sort of put a spanner in the works with your plan to join the military. Um, uh, yeah. Have you? Yeah, there were certainly no. Um, once I once I moved out and started making motions to to live and to be out. Once I was out, and I felt like there was no seeing what my friend Ashley went through at West Point. There was no way I was going to 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 allow myself to go through that. Since the repeal of "Don't Ask, Don't Tell," have you considered joining the military again? I yes. Um, don't ask until was repealed while I was in law school. So there was some thought to going into the Judge Advocate General Corps, the, the military's uh, lawyers, um, military's legal arm. Um, but I, I decided against that because I had just moved on past that for, for such a, so many years I had moved on past wanting to be in the military that I considered it because I was like, oh, I could do this thing that I wanted to do years ago. But at that point, I was so far past wanting that kind of lifestyle that I, I didn't explore it. Certainly it came up as, as an option. Hmm. Um, I think it's amazing that, you know, for all of our, our queer Jewish, uh, or just queer um, siblings who have been interested in the military now that now they have that option. But now that they're presented. Um, so I'm really interested in your, so you were talking about going to, um, to purchase college and sort of pushing away from Judaism at that time. And then when you went to law school, uh, you sort of flipped the other way. You found uh, this progressive conservative synagogue and, um, you uh, you sort of began to em to embrace more of the community side. Um, can you talk a little bit about at at that time what what made you want to hold on to Judaism? Why was Judaism important to you? I always felt, and I still always feel like I I I. I've certainly felt in many, many places like I didn't belong. Well, genetics don't lie. <laughs> the Jewish community can't get rid of me that easily. Um, full disc, you know, in the interest of disclosure, my father is not Jewish. I'm genetically only half Ashkenaz, but I've always been, you know, always felt closer to the Jewish community than, you know, than, than not. So I've always felt the pull of a very strong, tight knit community. But then sometimes, um, you know, there can be drama in that small, tight knit community, um, especially in New York, when there's so many people in that small, tight knit community. So there's a give and take. Um, I certainly love feeling a part of it. Um, like, and then certainly sometimes that I, I'm not, I, I'm comfortable with the, with the space where we are right now, where like I can bring my boyfriend to a Passover Seder or to a, you know, to, to a Shabbat dinner and, um, you know, have that experience and we can have some mutual friends who are in that community whom I've known for a while, but then we don't, we might not see them that often, but it's still a great time when we do. So you've spoken about being openly gay in Jewish spaces. Are you openly Jewish in gay spaces? Yeah, I haven't, um, I, I've, I've certainly, uh, certainly one thing I'll never deny is, is being Jewish. Um, and considering that so many of my gay spaces and Jewish spaces have so overlapped and intertwined over years, um, there's no, uh, you know, I have no reason to, um, I'm a lawyer <laughs> being, being a lawyer in New York, it might as well, you know, your synagogue might as well be the bar association and vice versa. Um, so it, it's, uh, there hasn't been much of an opportunity to to want to or have to or need to or be willing to uh, deny being Jewish. You know, I often talk about this denial of being Jewish vis-a-vis -vis the Chabadniks. Um, love what they do, love them for it. But when I'm being chased down Franklin Avenue and Crown Heights by a 13-year-old Israeli uh, yeshiva bocher trying to put a yarmulke on my head, I'm not going to tell them I'm not Jewish. I refuse to deny being Jewish. But I don't, I don't want, I, I, I'm not ready for the Kiruv at the time. 
And I'm, uh, I'm not gonna, you know, when, when, when I'm walking down Eastern Parkway in Crown Heights and, um, you know, tons of Chabad boys are coming at me, asking me if I'm Jewish. In my head, I'm like, if you just say no, they'll leave you alone. But I'm never going to deny being Jewish to anybody, even Chabadniks, even when I know what they're, <laughs> what they're trying to do. And I'm like, I don't have time to, I'll lie and say that maybe I put tefillin on that morning, which is a lie. I haven't put tefillin on since my friend's baby's brist a decade ago. But maybe I'll lie and say I put tefillin on that morning, but I'm certainly not going to tell that I'm not Jewish just to get them to go away. Hmm. So your boyfriend, I have to ask. Tell us the cute story of how you met. <laughs> it's really cute. Um, and I love telling it. So uh, oftentimes when we, when, when there's often a, guys go to Fire Island, right? And Fire Island is, if you ever look at, if you look up Fire Island on a map, you'll see that Fire Island is a thin barrier island a couple of miles south of mainland Long Island. So when you go on Grinder or Scruff or any app, out there, you get a barrage of guys who are already in Fire Island. And then you'll get one mile, two miles, three miles away, a number of guys who are out on Long Island. It is known that you do not talk to the guys on Long Island. You just don't, you just, you just, you just ignore them. Um, one day, and whenever you're there and you log on to one of the apps, you, you get hit up by guys that are 10, 12 miles away. You know, they're on Long Island. You just ignore them because you just do. And one day, sure enough, I was heading home and I, this, this really, really, really cute guy hit me up on Scruff. And uh, I could instantly tell that he was out on Long Island, but I was just so drawn to him and he was so cute. And I responded and uh, we've been talking every day for the last five years, including living together and having a cat. David was living out on Long Island at the time with his parents. And uh, yeah, we just started talking. He moved into the city before we started dating. And then pretty much the week he moved into the city, we started hanging out. <laughs> it's really sweet. Yeah. I, I had no idea about this um, Long Island animosity. Well, it's not animosity, it's like a joking. <laughs> you just don't talk to the Long Island guys. It's just, it's just a known thing. I happen to the one time I happen to talk to the Long Island guy, I'm now in a four and a half year relationship with him. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to bring Jewishness into your? Well, I, I guess I'm being presumptuous. If if you want to have if you want to be married and have kids and have a family at some point down the track, would you want to bring Judaism into that life? Well, um, I have made the decision that I'm not gonna be having kids, at least that's in the short term. Um, well, short term and looking looking down the road, it's certainly not in, my, in the 10 year plan that I have for my life, having kids is not in it. Um, just, large purchase of lifestyle choice. Um, I highly respect my friends who have kids. Uh, just David and I just don't really feel it's for us. Um, but if I did, I would certainly say that um, them having a Jewish upbringing would be a priority for me. Hmm. Jared, what gives you strength? <laughs> um, well, certainly having an amazing partner who's helped me out through, um, you know, I've, I've had, um, I, uh, I have a, I have a mood control disorder, right. And which I'm very open about, um, because I've had some very tough times where I've, you know, I have, uh, I have a mood disorder that has caused me at times to just completely explode and go crazy and ballistic and once punch a wall and injure myself um, at an Oscar party, at a gay Jewish Oscar party actually, um, in front of 40 other people. So this is no lie, lots of other people know about it, um, including someone that you interviewed was there. Um, so I, having that and having gone through treatment for it and being a much better person on the other side and 
having a partner who completely has been through the worst of it with me and understands it and has literally once had to physically hold me down, um, that knowing that I've overcome that um, or that I'm that I'm constantly working on that certainly is something that strengthens my resolve. Thanks to be a crazy man. What? I used to be a crazy man. Uh, we don't use those words here. No, I know. <laughs> Thank you, Kanda. Thank you for your honesty. Of course. Um, I'd like to go all the way back to the very beginning. Not to your bris. We're gonna we're gonna skip that. <laughs> Thank you. How Thank you how that. do you remember an excruciating detail? No. Um, so you uh, you were born in. Brewster, Massachusetts? I uh, no, I was born, I grew up in Brewster, New York. Brewster, New York, okay. I, I wrote so many names of places down and I was trying to follow along. There, there is a um, Brewster, Massachusetts out on Cape Cod and people often make that, uh, make that, make that mistake, but no, it's uh, Brewster, New York. Okay, and is that the same as Hudson Valley or separate? It's in the Hudson Valley. Okay, Brewster in Hudson Valley in New York. Mm -hmm. Okay. Cool, I'm learning about geography here. <laughs> um, have you been back to, to Brewster recently? All the time, I was there last week. Last weekend, yeah, we went to have lunch with my mother. Oh, lovely. Um, have you observed how your shul, your synagogue and your school have evolved or not with their understanding of um, homosexuality? Um, so, Two way, you know, there's two pieces to that. So we'll address it separately. The school, um, after I left, opened up a gay straight alliance, um, had a transgender student, um, which was in the news at one point. Um, so the school went through some great experiences. The shul sadly closed last year, um, which is, you know, um, really hurtful uh, that, that my shul closed. Um, it just, younger, Gay, younger Jews, I'm gonna say younger gays, um, younger Jews, younger Jewish families are tending to move back to urban areas now. And these suburban shoals, um, unfortunately, not all of them are gonna survive that. And mine, mine was one of them. Um, since when I was there and before and and when it closed, it actually had a lesbian rabbi. So yes, they've learned they they before they closed learn a lot as well. Oh, wow. I'm sorry to hear it closed. I, I was too. I actually didn't know that it closed until a couple weeks ago. Um, I called my mother up and asked if she wanted me to, um, my mother goes to Shul and Yom Kippur. Um, and uh, that's the one time a year she goes, which is totally fine. That's a lot of people. And this year I had no, you know, all the, all the shoals in the city are closed. So I wasn't going anywhere. Um, you know, I usually go to CBSD, the big gay synagogue. Um, so I called her up and I was like, do you want company? My dad's not Jewish. She doesn't go. Um, I called her up and asked if she wanted company. And she goes, did you not hear? Beth Elohim is closed. So she went somewhere else, but because she was going so early in the day, I didn't, uh, I didn't go with her, but that's how I found out that Beth Elohim had closed. Well, yeah. I, uh, I have one final question for you. Sure. Other Jared. <laughs> uh, no, I, I'm probably the other Jared. Um, <laughs> We're so, all the other Jared, another Jared at some point. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know, I, I heard this story about one of my friends when Facebook was just starting in like 2008, I think, ish. He was one of the early adopters and he had a fairly common name and he had a, a Facebook Messenger chat with every single person in the world who has his name. <laughs> they all got so annoyed, like, why are you talking to me? But yeah. I think I was a part of that. <laughs> I, I vaguely remember that actually. Yeah, and when, when you, um, were you part of, you know, making your best friend, your mother and your, your other best friend, your sister in, in the Facebook um, about me section? Were you one no. of those? I don't, I don't remember that at all. I don't remember that part. The whole thing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so 
I have one final question. Going back to, to Brewster, when you were a kid, finding yourself, discovering your identity, you didn't have the vocabulary at the time, you discovered that much later, but your body was telling you that there was something unique, you know, and, and, and you, were, you were going through this process of, of self-discovery and the future was still being written. There were many questions yet to be answered. And all these years later, you know, you've been on this incredible journey and you've, you've achieved all this wisdom and knowledge to be where you are today. And I want to ask you, Jared, if you had a chance to speak to him, what would you say? You know, people, um, I, I should often, I always know that I should have this, uh, I should have an answer to this. Um, I would tell him to stop trying to fit in so damn much. Stop trying to, stop doing things on a whim. Um, don't transfer to Purchase College on a whim, even though I would still tell him to go to Purchase College because it was a good damn time, but don't do it on such a whim. Um, I would tell him, yeah, to stop doing things on such, on such a whim, take a second to really, really think about everything that you're doing and, and not, not do things so impulsively. Cause I, I do have a, I do tend to be on the impulsive side and I would certainly tell him to, uh, to, to, to not do that, to stop being so impulsive and to eat better. <laughs> I, you know, I have to say for a lawyer, <laughs> You haven't dodged a single question. You haven't, um, you've been um, very um, open. Uh, so thank you so much for sharing your story. Of course, thanks for having me. Uh, I think we've reached the end of our time here. Um, so again, I just wanna say um, the words that you have entered into our project having immense power to reach out to people ranging from Orthodox Jews all the way to non-Jewish LGBT plus people. There is a piece of your story that they can either directly identify with or something that will um, expand their mind with, with a new life experience. And, um, you know, there's a phrase I like to use, which is it's impossible to hate someone if you understand them. And I hope that your story um, helps that process of, of us understanding each other as humans. I have one final thing to say, which is here's to sharing our story in this moment and many more moments in the future. Thank you, Jared. Mine. Mine. Thank you.